Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for thanks to GitHub for inviting me. I'm super thrilled and, and honored to participate in this. My name is Gene Kogan, and uh, this is called Frontiers of Neural Arts, and I'm just going to get uh, straight into it. Um, so just a little bit of background about myself. I, I first became interested in machine learning around 2007, 2008. Things like Last.fm um, were first beginning to experiment with things like uh, music recommendation systems. I was a big music collector and really interested in music technology. And this is kind of uh, the first question that I first became interested in. Um, learned it was a machine learning problem, how to recommend music to people. Um, and in that ecosystem, I kind of learned that a lot of people interested in the intersection between music and machine learning are also interested in problems having to do with creativity and composition and production of music. Um, I started working with a, a good friend of mine named Jeff Snyder, who built these uh, really awesome musical instruments like what you see here. This is called a burl. It's an electronic flute instrument. And it's just the controller it has a whole bunch of breath pressure. It has a breath pressure sensor and an embouchure sensor on the mouthpiece and then a whole bunch of capacitive touch sensors. And the trick that we employed was to, uh, well, it doesn't make any sound by itself. And so we would try to hook it up with a digital synthesizer, uh, which we would try to then parameterize using the controllers on the, on, the, on the controller that the musician was playing. So it was kind of inverting the normal process for, uh, for music, you know, instead of learning how to play an instrument, the instrument sort of learns how to, how to be played by, um, how to be played. So uh, this is a, a taste of what it sounded like. Um, so this kind of got me interested in, in just in general into interactivity and new media arts. I began to uh, take interest in things like computer vision, uh, data visualization, and all of these really cool things. Um, one thing that I uh, made that, that gained some traction a, a few years ago was Connect Projector Toolkit, which you see on the right side. Um, this enables somebody to calibrate a projector, video projector, with a Connect depth camera. And this would allow you to create sort of spatially aware, uh, body reactive projections. Um, this was kind of tweaked to, to work on this piece called machine learning with a uh, with a robot and kind of keeping my machine learning projects to the side but but kind of coming back to it um, in a big way starting around four uh, maybe four or five years ago when when deep learning uh, hit um, so most of the rest of the stuff I'm going to show you in this presentation is is going to have a lot to do with uh, neural networks and particularly in the context of computer vision and the main thing uh, that that you want to keep in mind about these that'll be relevant for the rest of the projects that I show you is that neural networks are really great at learning patterns and sort of salient patterns that define the things that we're interested in. So for example, this is a neural network looking at an image of a cat and all of these different cells represent the amount, the, the activation of a particular feature or pattern in the image at every possible spatial location. And you can see that some of the cells uh, appear to be looking for things on the foreground, some in the background, some are looking for simple things like edges and, and gradients, uh, but all of them are sort of finding features and, and the features that are sort of relevant to, to a cat. And um, now this uh, kind of, uh, when, when deep learning began to, uh, make inroads in computer vision, uh, many people wanted to know what do neural networks actually see because you know, it's a little bit of a black box. We don't really know exactly what the neurons are trained to recognize. And so some of the experiments that began maybe around 10 years ago, um, looking at research like, like uh, what you see in the screen above, attempted to answer this question by trying to um, you know, make interesting procedures for generating visuals that would help us understand what neural networks were seeing. And what you're looking at here are, um, well, the process would be, for example, for this image, um, you want to activate the bell pepper neuron of this neural network. And so um, the idea here would be to, to optimize the pixels of an image so as to maximally activate the bell pepper neuron or the computer keyboard neuron or the ostrich neuron. And this would uh, allow us to, to see what those features look like to maybe inspect features, the hidden features in the in the neural network that weren't labeled, uh, but that nevertheless we could then use to interpret exactly what the network was seeing. And a couple of years after uh, some of this work began to emerge, uh, it was taken to the next level by a few researchers at, at Google who developed uh, the uh, deep dream technique. 
And uh, before DeepStream, they they made a whole bunch of innovations to this visualization technique, um, which made much more vivid pictures that were much more realistic. You know, you could see starfish and bananas and parachutes and so on, and they're very, very realistic. And this was kind of when neural networks first caught the eye of, um, you know, new media and interactivity and, and artists, new media artists and interactivity designers and so on. So um, I was super interested in this technique. I began to work with it myself. And uh, the, the first thing that I really wanted to do was to try to gain back some of the control uh, that an artist is used to having with, uh, with techniques that they use to make, make their art. Um, one of the things about Deep Dream is that it felt a little bit like a magic trick, like it would just make these, you know, crazy sort of psychedelic, you know, visuals, um, but that they did all of the work themselves. And I was really interested in kind of trying to gain back a lever of control um, that I could use to compose with. And the first way that I tried to do that was using masks. And the idea of masks would be to try to uh, allocate different parts of the canvas to different neurons that I wanted to visualize. And so here there's a mask which goes from left to right, kind of, you know, zero to one, and then from uh, left to right, one to zero. And each one was devoted to a particular neuron. And then if you apply this mask during this iterative process that optimizes the pixels, what you get is uh, all on one side, you know, one particular feature is, is visualized, all on the other side, another feature. And in the middle, it kind of uh, sees, it attempts to sort of kind of get features of, of both of these neurons, um, it, it, it sort of satisfies both of them a little bit. And so this is kind of an example, a, a full-size example of what that looks like. You could see that there's two neurons here connected by this interpolated horizontal mask. And the mask can be composed however you want. So in this uh, example that you're looking at, the mask is circular. So there's um, sort of one neuron being visualized in the center of this, of this, um, uh, of this rectangle. And then on the outside, you have a, another neuron which appears more like flowers, um, something like that. Uh, the technique could also be used to generate video um, because it always begins with an input image. The input image is what you start with and then you attempt to optimize the pixels so as to meet your objectives. So you could just simply take the last picture that you made and plug it in as the input to the, to the, to the algorithm again to make the next frame in the sequence. And you do this over and over, maybe in between you do things like you distort the canvas somehow or you rotate it or you um, expand it somehow. Um, and this combined with masks gave me a whole lot more control, uh, ability to compose with these techniques to create the, the kinds of visuals that I wanted to see. And this was sort of um, what I did with it. Here's another example. Um, here, an, a picture of an eye was segmented into, and then each of the segments became masks. And then th th these masks were combined with a bunch of different neurons that I chose and uh, to, to compose this final result. And you can see that the it's really great, uh, I think, how, kind of how the masks fit in. Um, it, it, there's no, you know, sort of, there's no white space, there's no uh, blending, it just kind of, it, it works for, it, it just fits in very nicely. And so I was always really, really, um, really enth enthused about that. Um, here, this is kind of doing the same feedback loop, but, but uh, also creating a, uh, completely never-ending loop. So the trick about these two videos that you that you probably won't notice for a little while is that they're perfect loops that are just three seconds long. So if I hover over the video, you'll see the the key um, keynote that it just keeps on rotating about after every three seconds. And so this was something that I figured out how to do, and it's a little bit of a cool illusion because it it looks um, kind of like it's always expanding outward, but it never really goes anywhere. So it's kind of uh, I think of it as the visual equivalent of a, a of a shepherd tone. So um, this uh, endless loop can be combined with other neural neural arts techniques. So this is a technique called texture synthesis, very closely related to style transfer, which I'll mention in a, in, a, in a few slides. And here there's a texture synthesis based off of the famous uh, Japanese painting by Hokusai, uh, The Great Wave of Kanagawa. And this is uh, just kind of zooming in endlessly, rotating, and it never goes anywhere. Again, it just kind of like keeps on rotating endlessly, like an endless zoom. Um, uh, using now Kandinsky as a source texture, um, same basic idea, endless loop. And um, you, know, you can do this pretty 
pretty um, effectively with almost anything that you put into it. Even things like Google Maps end up working. Um, and this is probably my favorite. Why I why why I have it last? It looks kind of like a nightmare. You know, you're just kind of on your phone inside of a nightmare, zooming in, and the map just never really really resolves into anything readable. Um, more examples. This is the loops and the canvas um, and the masking combined with with the deep dream technique. Um, and again, really, the idea is always to try to take these very powerful techniques, but give back more compositional ability to masks or through canvas distortion um, or some other means. Um, another example of using uh, source images as masks, on the left you see the Mona Lisa, pretty recognizable. Um, all of the segments of the Mona Lisa have been devoted into masks and this is also a perfect loop. And then uh, the fellow on the right, which maybe some of you recognize if you keep track of the field of deep learning, uh, this is Jan LeCun, who's, who's one of the uh, pioneers of deep learning. He he first got convolutional neural networks to work on some kind of a, a meaningful applied problem. So I mentioned earlier style transfer. This is another technique that I've had quite a lot of fun with over the last uh, over the last few years. Um, this is basically the recomposition regeneration of one image in the style of another image. So what you're looking at is the Mona Lisa in the style of Van Gogh, in the style of Hokusai, in the style of of, of Google Maps. Um, I really never get tired of using this Google Maps texture. Um, style transfer has been one of my most popular techniques. I've, I've installed it a, a, in the form of a mirror. Um, so what you're looking at here is an installation that I call Cubist Mirror. It's called that because the first version of it was using a Cubist painting, but now it's, it's um, using a variety of different paintings. And it's basically a style transfer mirror. So you get in front of it and you see yourself as though you're a, a Picasso painting or, or in the style of Hokusai. Kids really love it, um, as you can tell. So I'm gonna switch gears and talk about uh, another area of machine learning that really excites me, and that's generative models. And generative models are neural networks which are capable of, of actually synthesizing images or text or sound. Um, they are they're, um, extreme, of extreme interest to scientists and engineers. Um, they have many, many applications in content generation. So content generation for things like chatbots, question and answering services, uh, video games, uh, you know, per perhaps even uh, completely synthetic bands and, and, and music. And uh, all of this stuff is in the early pipeline, but it's, uh, but it's um, you know, rapidly improving. Um, also very interesting, uh, the application of generative models to reinforcement learning, which is the area of of machine learning, which is concerned with creating agents or robot or robots, um, robots need to be able to sort of imagine the future, uh, to have an imagination in order to, to to play it out and decide kind of to decide on some kind of an action to take. Uh, generative models are neural networks, which very very, <laughs> um, at the very very most abstract sense, they are um, trained on lots and lots of images or sounds or text or whatever it is that they that you want to train on and it's capable of outputting images which look like they came from the original data whatever it is that you trained on whether it be faces or cats or dogs or trucks or you know or airplanes and so on um, and they output images which do not come from the original data but look as though they could have um, and there's kind of a few dominant paradigms for this autoencoders were the the sort of granddaddy of generative models they've been um, chugging along for the last 10 to, to 15 years. Generative adversarial networks or GANs have sort of eaten up all the press in the last few years. They've been responsible for most of the most of the um, sort of like, uh, well, the most visually, um, the images that have the highest visual fidelity, let's say, um, of the last few years. And so lots of people are pretty excited about GANs. Um, the first implementation of a, of a, con uh, of a GAN which worked on images um, uh, was a DC GAN, which was made by, by these people in 2015. And they demonstrated really, really wild, you know, um, characteristics of this, of this uh, technique. They showed how you can do arithmetic on the feature space. So you can take an image of a man with glasses and then find the latent vector for just man, add the latent vector for a woman, and you get man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses. So you have this sort of ability to add and delete and modify uh, features on, on, on generative images as though they're kind of like DNA. Um, so 
I used their implementation of DCGAN to make a, um, a, a project called A Book from the Sky. This was my first project with GANs, and it's basically trained on uh, a data set of handwritten Chinese characters, and um, which, I, which was uh, being collected at the University of Harbin. Basically, for the purposes of optical character recognition, I was really interested in using them for, for GANs, and so I got permission to use this data set. And it's really interesting to look at these interpolations and see the different ways that people write um, in Chinese. I learned quite a lot, uh, a, bit, a bit about um, Chinese handwriting. You can read more in this uh, blog post that I wrote about it. This is another um, cut from there. These are interpolations between different characters. Um, and you can see that the, 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 the characters that lay in between um, are really quite striking because it's almost as though they stand for concepts that that exist in this sort of, you know, this conceptual fabric that we're given from language, but but that there are no characters devoted to. And so I was I was really quite, um, yeah, this was kind of a, a really satisfying project for me. Uh, my most recent uh, use of these, I trained uh, again on around 100,000 paintings um, collected from a website called WikiArt. And WikiArt is this open source collection of, of, of um, you know, hundreds of years worth of, of art. And um, you can see that it's capable of synthesizing what looks like uh, medieval portraits, to document archives, to, to landscapes, to photographs, to, um, you know, uh, all sorts of genres are, are kind of inside this, um, inside this GAN. Um, again, in the same spirit, this is using a GAN called Big GAN. Uh, here I'm combining uh, different classes that are inside Big GAN and finding, um, so for example, on the left side you have an owl, and in the middle you have a dog, um, and then on the right side you have basically uh, an owl dog. And This is kind of in the, the same idea that I showed in the DC GAN paper in which they are able to add and subtract features at will. Um, another example of this owl dog. It looks a little bit like a, a Harry Potter, um, Harry Potter character. I, I've always kind of really enjoyed this this one. And this is a owl mixed with a cat. Looks like a snow leopard, something like that. Um, this is a, and this is my favorite. This is a whale uh, or an orca, and then a tram in the middle, and then this is the whale plus the tram. And the whale plus a tram ends up looking like a fairy. And so this is kind of like a, a, a really unexpected serendipitous result. Uh, the last thing I'll show you with Big Gan, this is a, uh, on the left side, what you see is a video taken from YouTube. Um, this is Planet Earth, you know, BBC documentary about how beautiful our Earth is. And then uh, there's a pipeline in which each frame is analyzed and predicted for all the classes, all, the, all of the different objects that appear in the image. And that's your, that becomes the label vector, which you then feed into BigGAN in order to generate an image with those labels. Um, and so in some sense, it's, it's BigGAN attempting to, um, to regenerate the video on the left. And so whenever it has you know, mushrooms, you'll see mushrooms. Whenever it has um, you know, different kinds of birds and monkeys, um, you'll see those. See the monkeys kind of being generated there. Foxes, some undersea creatures. Sometimes it's a little unsure, and so it can be it can be pretty wild. Um, another category of generative models that I'm really interested in are these image to image translation uh, networks. Uh, the first one of these that that gained a lot of the attention of the art world was Pix to Pix, and so they demonstrated how you can train a neural network to basically create the most advanced image filters. So one image filter which takes a label map and then uh, converts it into a facade, like a photograph of a building, or a label map into a street view scene, black and white photo to a color photograph, um, taking satellite imagery and converting it into maps or possibly maps into satellite imagery, uh, day photos into night photos, edges, um, you know, edge drawings into photographs, and so on, lots of different examples of this. Uh, my first project with this, which was with some collaborators in, in, in Milan at Open.Lab uh, for a project we called Invisible Cities. This is named after the book by Italo Calvino. And here what we did was we, we downloaded lots of map tiles from OpenStreetMaps and, and corresponding satellite imagery. 
uh, from a whole bunch of different cities and train picks the picks in order to convert the map tiles into the satellite imagery tiles. And then what you could do is once you have these models, you can take the map, uh, map tiles from, from one city and run it through the generative model of another city. And so you get this sort of city style transfer. So for example, on the left here, you have uh, overhead of Milan. And then in the middle, you have Milan, that part of Milan in the style of Los Angeles, and then Milan in the style of Venice, and so on. Um, I also use Pix to Pix to create uh, sort of, um, I guess, deep fakes before they were called that. This is from, um, I think, 2016, um, in which I basically made like a, uh, a President Trump, uh, well, meat puppet, as I called it. This is a, a little way of, of uh, puppeteering the president's face. And then one year later, it was it was around this quality. And this is sort of my hacked version of this uh, idea of being able to synthesize somebody, you know, steal somebody's face essentially in their likeness. Uh, but if you, but of course, you know, now it's becoming hyper realistic. And so that you're looking at work by by Nvidia in which they are demonstrating this technique um, to the point that it's almost impossible to distinguish the real faces from the from the fake ones. And so I kind of think sometimes my job as an artist to, is to warn people about the future. Um, you know, so something like being able to steal somebody's face, their digital likeness, um, didn't seem so compelling in 2016 when it looked like this. Um, but you know, if you're if you're looking into it, you may realize that, it, that it's actually quite a bit closer than it first seems. Um, so I'm also interested in interactive installations. So here you can see an installation um, that I made at a museum in Berlin called Futurium. Um, this is, if you get a chance to, to be in Berlin, once all this madness dies down, you can go see it. Um, it's right in the center. And the idea here is that you're able to draw label maps of, um, you know, just mountains and clouds and, and water and grass and trees and so on. And then what's what is that's converted to on the right side is what looks uh, like a photograph. It's not completely realistic, but what looks like a photograph of, of what you just drew. Um, and along the same lines, this is invisible cities, except reimagined as an interactive installation. So here you have these plastic pieces, which correspond to, to grass, to, to water, and to buildings. And then um, as you move them around this little playpen, um, there's a camera which is picking them up uh, and then converting the image into what looks like a satellite image of Berlin. Um, and so all of these are installations I've been I've been pleased to use for the last little while. Another interactive installation I'll show you is with a collaborator of mine named Andreas Refsgaard. And the idea here is that you can draw musical instruments and then have the music music automatically generated using those instruments. So let's watch that. See Andreas has drawn a drum, and so now it begins to play drums. Puts a keyboard on the screen, draws a saxophone and another set of drums, uh, and it begins to play some more. So these are kind of fun ways of making music interactively work well as interactive installations. And um, yeah, we had quite a lot of fun with this project. Andreas is actually on later at GitHub Satellite, so I encourage you to check out his talk as well. Um, another repository that I had quite a lot of fun with was uh, Glow. This is an invertible generative model, which means that you can take an existing photograph, like a real image, and then back project it into the latent space so that you could then generate the image with the model and there, then once you have it inside the model, you can do all of the things that the model allows you to do, make uh, feature edits, subtractions and additions and so on. Um, so, you know, I could take a picture of myself and make my hair blonde, put glasses on myself, makeup and so on. Um, and this is just, you know, playing with all of the different, you know, versions of myself that might exist under in, in some parallels. Um, and you could also use it to make interpolations between yourself and other people. This is me being converted into a certain Canadian pop star that you might all recognize. Um, this is me being converted into some heads of state that's, um, well, I, I'm sure you recognize all of them. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, have you ever seen me in the room with them, with any of them at the same time? That's, that's really all. <laughs> Um, this is another app that I had a little fun with. Maybe some of you remember FaceApp. It was pretty popular in the App Store for a little while on iPhone. 
Um, it allows you to take a picture of a face and then put a smile on it. And so this is not my actual smile. This is just the face apps, you know, version of my smile. And then what you could do with, I, I thought it would be interesting to take the output of that image and then run it again through the smile filter and then to take the output of that image and run it again through the smile filter. And so if you've ever been interested in what that might look like, it looks basically something like this. And then right around now, it stops picking up faces. And so the algorithm basically breaks at this point. Um, so there's someone told me that this looks a little bit like Aphex Twin. Um, and so yeah, I think that was kind of what I'm going for. Um, and then, you know, just having fun, lots of ways. I think there's a lot of fun to be had in, in these kinds of neural arts here. I'm projecting Einstein's face into the Crab Nebula. This is really closely related to style transfer. Um, and then, so I started inserting myself into various paintings. Um, I know this is super creepy here, me behind, uh, me behind here. Um, yeah, just kind of lots of having, having fun with this. Um, yeah, this is basically the, the, the idea. So I'm going to tell you about one more, one more project here called Abraham, uh, which is um, basically a project to create what I call an autonomous artificial artist. I've been working on this very slowly for the last two and a half years. Um, it's a pretty futuristic project, and so I'm making very slow incremental progress. The objective is to create an, uh, an agent which makes unique and original art, and it demonstrates autonomy. Uh, that means that it's... Uh, that it's an AI artist. It's it's really sort of the missing piece in AI, in my opinion, which is which is autonomy, and it kind of follows in the tradition of AI arts projects like Aaron by Harold Cohen and um, Dancing Fool, and lots of these projects in which they attempted to create agents which which autonomously make works. And so I've been interested in this idea of what really true autonomy looks like in a in a computer, and I thought that we can. Uh, I looked in nature for some inspiration. And so I, I find inspiration from things like uh, beehives and flocks of bees and termite mounds. And all of these are examples of super organisms. And the idea that I'm, I'm kind of after is this metaphor that we have in which we associate some kind of intelligence, uh, you know, a collective intelligence from a super organism, you know, so that the, that the hive of bees has its own mind, the hive mind. Um, and this is uh, um, this is kind of the, um, the 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 metaphor that I'm using to guide the development of this program. And so my idea is to try to achieve this same sort of um, the same sort of collective intelligence by creating a generative art program whose behavior is uh, is emerges from the collective intelligence of the people. Who, who make it. And so it's kind of this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network of, of actors who are collaborating together to make something which behaves um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's unpredictable to each of them. Um, and so I, I, I'm kind of really after this hive mind metaphor um, to try to, to, you know, uh, to demonstrate something that really truly has its own agency. And um, the Construction that I that I think might be able to achieve this is a decentralized uh, decentralized machine learning process in which a generative model is tr trained um, using a, a set of technologies which which allow a group of people to co-own that model together as a shared secret. And so these are technologies including federated learning, secure multi-party computation, lots of different emerging techniques in in secure and private AI that allow a group of, of, of collaborators to, to essentially co-own uh, a neural network together to, um, and, and, and these are of course much more general. The, the idea is that you know, a group of people can use machine learning to make uh, something that creates value for them um, and, and that, can, that, can, um, that can stand for, for things that we find valuable in many, many fields, you know, medical applications, financial applications, social applications, and so on. Um, and maybe it can also make art. Um, and so this is kind of the, the goal of this project. And it's a really slow work in progress. It's very multi-dimensional, multi kind of draws from, from decentra decentralization technologies, from AI and computer art, and, and from philosophy of mind. And, and so it's, it's really kind of uh, my new obsession. Um, okay, so I just have a few seconds left. I'm just going to really quickly mention I do a lot of workshops. I've been teaching workshops as a full-time job for the last couple of years, and all of this has led into a book 
called Machine Learning for Artists. This is a website online at mlforay.github.io where I create a whole, where I and along with collaborators, including Andreas, who I mentioned earlier, we work on lots of uh, demonstrations, tutorials, applications that are able to um, show you how to use machine learning for your own work. I also teach classes online and, re and post those on ML4A. So if you're interested in all of the 30 hours of this, then you can go uh, learn for yourself how this stuff works. I'm also an advisor to Runway. You probably just saw Chris and Anastasis. I'm really big um, fan of Runway and very excited about the ability to kind of make this stuff super easy for people to use. So, um, so that's all the time I have. Thanks for listening, and uh, I'll see you soon. Okay, bye bye.